ticks towards the two-year deadline. Let's listen in to the introduction. We should be hearing from David Davis very shortly. Uh, Secretary Davis, we know you and your team will carry an enormous responsibility on behalf of the British people. And I know you'll be talking today about the road ahead and how you look forward to a more nimble, more flexible, uh, and a more innovative uh, British uh, society going forward. And of course, here in the room, you have partners in that endeavor. Uh, but we clearly have a huge stake in the transatlantic relationship, uh, not just in terms of commercial terms, where the United States and Europe account for nearly 40% of global GDP, where we trade about $2.5 billion a day and have an overall $5.5 trillion trade and investment relationship. But the relationship is a lot deeper than numbers. And if you think about the history of Europe and the United States fighting world wars together, shoulder to shoulder, strengthening international institutions, and spreading the values of democracy and the rule of law around the world, you understand at the heart of this special relationship is the one between the United States and UK. Now, I could cite a lot of statistics. I could talk about the UK single largest investor is the United States. I can mention, of course, uh, that the UK is the United States' seventh largest trading partner and the fourth largest export destination. Uh, that trade and investment between our two countries accounts for millions of jobs and that today over 42,000 American firms export to the UK and more than 7,500 represented in part here today have operations in the UK. I think that just underscores a partial significance to this relationship. But as you embark on this journey, unprecedented journey, it's important that the United States business community and our government work close hand in hand with you to support your endeavors, your goals, and your aspirations, as we clearly have a stake in the outcome of these discussions. Which is why the Chamber founded the US-UK Business Council, one of the 15 existing councils we now run, to work not only to strengthen the relationship between UK and the US, but also to look at the work of the Brexit areas. We have three simple objectives, and first I should begin by saying that I'll have more say on this topic later, at a different time, uh, but we're very pleased that Rob Rooney, who is one of the leaders of Morgan Stanley, has chosen to become chair of this UK Council. The objectives are clear. We want the UK and EU to agree on clear terms of exit and build a strong foundation for ongoing cooperation. And of course, we want to encourage you uh, to have predictable transition periods that avoids a cliff edge and ensures a strong future partnership going forward. Second, we want to clarify or clarity on the way forward uh, when you can in terms of minimizing business disruption and encourage both sides uh, to understand the real consequences of failure to secure a sound deal. And finally, we want to lay the groundwork for strengthening further US-UK ties through a future trade agreement when the time is right and when you tell us, UK, that you're ready for that kind of commitment. American companies have a huge commitment to your country, and we know that these will not be easy negotiations between the UK and the EU. We know there are critics out there who are talking about divisions and unrealistic approaches. Uh, we also know that there is another response to that, which is to get to work and to ensure that you and the UK are able to move forward in your discussions uh, with Europe. We want you to know that we're eager to be hearing from you about how we can be helpful in our work here in the United States and in Europe. We're eager to hear more about how the UK will deal with the flow of workers and data across borders. We're here to hear more about regulatory cooperation and intellectual property rights protection, and more, of course, about market access for goods and financial services, and more about customs and trade facilitation, issues I know very much on your agenda. In due course, we'll release a paper outlining our views on these critical issues, which we will share with you, Secretary Davis, and your team. Though the negotiations are going to be tough, and they'll have their ups and downs, clearly, 
uh, we see some similarities into what the United States now faces in the NAFTA context. Our key messages to the Trump administration has been, uh, I think, in some ways, uh, contextually important and also relevant to your discussions. First, we've encouraged our administration and our partners in Mexico and Canada to do no harm, to recognize the tremendous benefits of the relationship, to move quickly, and, and fourth, to ensure a seamless transition. The stakes are high, but our commitment to you and your government is that we are very supportive of the special relationship that our two countries have. Now let me turn briefly uh, to an introduction of Secretary Davis, and we all look forward to his comments. He was appointed Secretary of State for exiting the European Union in July 2016. He has been an MP since 1987, representing a district in Northeast England. He's, had, he's held an array of government positions, including Science Minister, Shadow Deputy Prime Minister, and Shadow Home Secretary. <clears throat> Before being elected to Parliament, he worked in the agri-food industry, and therefore, if you look at the totality of his background experiences, there's hardly a better fit for a person with this set of responsibilities in ensuring the UK interests are closely guarded and represented in these exit negotiations. Uh, during his time in the reserves, we understand uh, Secretary Davis ensured a, or had a few broken noses along the way uh, on more than one occasion. Uh, we know that uh, how these things go, but we know you're also able to throw punches back. And so, Secretary Davis, welcome to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and welcome to a business community very supportive of the U.S.-U.K. relationship. Thank you. Myron, thank you for those uh, generous and supportive comments, particularly the ones at the end, very generous to me. I mean, so generous, I wish my parents were still alive. You know, my father would have enjoyed it. My mother might have believed it. Um, the, um, but uh, good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to be here. I am a, I'm a long-standing, what Myron didn't say is I'm a long-standing fan of the United States. You are, I guess, the only country to be successfully founded on an idea. And the idea of freedom, the rule of law, democracy working together. And uh, uh, as such, it's a privilege to be here. Now, the last time I was in the States, I was actually, not the last time I was in the States, the last time I gave a, a major speech in the States, it was in Texas. Uh, uh, now, of course, uh, a state now facing the devastating natural disaster of Hurricane Harvey. Now, the people of the United States and the United Kingdom are one and the same. We stand side by side through tough times, through world wars, through terrorism, uh, through natural disasters. And as always, Britain will be here as a friend uh, to help in any way we can. So I'll start just by saying to you that as you may be sure that uh, not just for me, but all my fellow countrymen, our thoughts and prayers are with the American people suffering uh, through their current tragedy. So uh, I just want to make that on the record first. Now, I've just, as Myron tells you, I've just flown in from Brussels, where we've been busy with detailed negotiations over our departure from the European Union. For the UK, the overarching aim of those talks is securing a successful future partnership with the European Union, one that delivers the most seamless and frictionless trade in goods and services possible. Now, there are many that doubt this is possible, but uh, my, when I spoke to my European counterpart, Michel Barnier, uh, I said to him once, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, the optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty, and as ever on that front, I am a determined optimist in this. We will get to those opportunities. Because fundamentally, I believe that a good deal is in the interests of both the United Kingdom and the European Union, and of the entire global community, a point I'm going to come on to in some depth. And I know that US firms, many of those represented in this room, want clarity over our approach to Brexit. But you, I mean businessmen will understand, businessmen and women will understand better than anyone. You don't start a negotiation knowing the exact conclusion. Instead, you know the broad aims in advance and navigate the best way to achieve the desired outcome. 
Now, the UK has begun to lay out those strategic aims in detail through the publication of about a dozen papers on the partnership that we want to build with the European Union on areas as diverse as customs, dispute resolution, data, the sorts of things that Myron was referring to earlier. And we've begun to navigate our way towards them. And I am confident that we can deliver success in this. But this morning, I want to step away from the detail of our negotiations in Brussels. I mean, you can raise them in questions afterwards. We'll have some questions afterwards. But I want to step away from the detail for the moment to look beyond to the next few years, to the kind of country the United Kingdom will be outside the European Union, and to outline how, by working together with our closest friends and allies, most particularly the United States, we can tackle the greatest social and economic challenges we face in this era of globalization. Now, my message is clear. The answer to these challenges is not to turn inwards and become isolationist. The answer to the economic problems of the West cannot be to turn our back on globalization and trade. It's to lead the world forward once again. To do this, we must address the imbalance between trade in goods and trade in services something already recognized in this country on many fronts, I know. And we must develop our economy in areas where we have a competitive advantage. This is the great prize that we can win from Brexit, a Britain committed to striking new free trade agreements across the globe, including with the European Union. A Britain cooperating with our friends and allies to drive up standards around the world. A Britain which is liberal and international in both temperament and outlook. For the UK, the terms of engagement are really quite simple. We are the world's fifth largest economy. We lead the world, along with you, in our adaptation of technology. And we'll soon be setting out the terms of our own independent trade policy outside the European Union. But achieving this won't be easy. So we need global businesses to help us deliver our global vision. Business that many of you represent in this room. Sometimes, when speaking to colleges and academic institutions, I pose a question to the audience. I say to them, what idea or invention has in the last 50 years done the most to save the lives of hundreds of millions of people and improve the lives of billions? As you might imagine, the answer I get back from students and, uh, and the like tends to be something like antibiotics or some other piece of medical technology. The real answer is free trade and capitalism. Free trade has delivered an unrivaled increase in prosperity across the globe in the last 50 years. It's raised more people out of poverty than any or all government initiatives put together. But now, the world is undergoing an extraordinary period of economic change. Advances in technology are generating new forms of uh, production and disrupting others. And it feels to me it's necessary to make the case once more for free trade and capitalism. For me, here in the United States is the logical place to start that, to make that case. The United States is the crucible of the modern technological revolution. It's here in America we're seeing some of the most dramatic advances in technology, in artificial intelligence, in genetics and biotechnology, in robotics. Often this is happening in partnership with companies uh, and research centers based in the United Kingdom. Our countries and companies are great collaborators, pushing the boundaries of academic research, producing more research together than any other nations. We do, of course, have the greatest number of Nobel Prize winners in each of our countries uh, than any other nation. Now, Myron told you I come from, I represent uh, the northeast of England. Two centuries ago, it was the north of England rather than the west coast of America that drove the Industrial Revolution. We associate the Industrial Revolution with the great technologies of the era, the combustion engine, electricity, the, the railway. But it was free trade as much as the technological change which created that wave of globalization. Free trade helped spread that technology beyond Europe. It was free trade that helped transform Britain's domestic economy. It took Britain from being a large, 
and largely rural economy at the end of the 18th century to a largely industrial one at the end of the 19th century. A revolution that was more than matched in this country 70 years later, the era of Vanderbilt and Carnegie, Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan. Our openness to goods from across the globe allowed us to import the food we needed so we could focus on the products that we were best placed to manufacture. These changes had a transformational effect on the way British people live and work then and now. At the beginning of the 18th century, around 50% of the people worked in agriculture. Today, that's under 1%. That transformation wasn't always easy. It changed the social fabric of both our countries. It ripped apart conventional political parties, turned normal politics upside down. Sound familiar? <laughs> but the fact is, it led to a society which is unequivocally better off. Now, once more, we're seeing a shift in production of manufactured goods, this time from west to east. In 1990, less than 3% of the world manufactured goods were made in China. Now it's just under a quarter. To those in the industrial towns across the UK who are driving the early waves of globalization, this new era of change may feel like a threat. And there are good reasons to think globalization isn't working for everyone in Britain, the United States, Europe, and the rest of the Western world. Sluggish productivity growth has left wages falling for many in the UK and the US. Our current account deficits are high. The UK and US have for a long time spent more than we save, meaning we need to borrow from abroad to cover the shortfall. These are significant economic challenges that we face. And the response of the international community has been to reduce rather than intensify our cooperation on matters of trade. Last year, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, recorded a rise in new protectionist measures, the first time in many years. And we saw that, that measures to restrict free trade were outstripping measures to encourage it. We've also seen examples of countries failing to play by the rules, in turn creating risks to the global system. Nowhere is this clearer than in relation to the dumping of steel on global markets, something I know is uh, a cogent issue here. The urgent need to act to remove excess capacity has been recognized, but not enough has been done. But the 1930s also taught us the dangers of protectionism. It damages global trade. Between 1929 and 1932, volumes of trade fell by a quarter, and half of that was down to new trade barriers. Barriers that deeply inhibited global and domestic growth. So it's through free trade that we can deliver sustainable growth in our economy. The bottom line is, that the only sustainable way to deliver better public services, higher real wages, increased living standards, is through boosting productivity. This means more trade, not less. For Britain, it means maintaining our strong trade links with European markets after we leave the e European Union, as well as seeking out new opportunities for trade and investment with old friends and new alike, and of course with fast-growing and em emerging economies. That's why uh, the Trade Secretary, our Trade Secretary, was here in July to launch the US-UK Trade and Investment Working Group dedicated to comprehensively strengthening our bilateral relationship. At home, Britain will remain open to the talent, the ideas and the capital that have driven success in the past. Tackling regional economic disparity through our new industrial strategy, creating an economy that works for all. And we will drive that message at a global level too by redoubling our efforts to open up new markets and strengthen the rules-based trading system that ensure trade is free and fair for all. For both the UK and the US, the, target of that, the, the major target of that effort should be the liberalization of the service sector. It represents roughly 80%, services represent roughly 80% of our, of our economies. Doing so gives us the potential to revitalize productivity and growth but we must work together to convince other countries of the benefits. Crucially, we must continue to engage the multilateral institutions, including the World Trade Organization, because they have an important role to play in finding solutions that help share the benefits of globalization more evenly. Success would help us demonstrate that multilateral organizations remain relevant 
adaptable and credible. At the same time as delivering a global economy that works better for all citizens. Inside the European Union, with many other member states, we have worked to liberalise trade and services. And we've had some success, limited, but some success. But once we're, once we're outside the European Union, we'll push harder still. And we will by spearheading a move to open up trade in services to boost productivity and growth in industries where the UK and the US have a competitive advantage. Opening up service markets also brings another benefit. As the Governor of the Bank of England has said, a lack of liberalisation in services is one of the reasons for the size of our trade deficit with the rest of the world. Recent history has taught us that large excess trade imbalances can be damaging for the entire global economy. These imbalances were a contributor to the financial crisis of 2007 and the Eurozone crisis half a decade ago. Surplus, surplus countries saved vast amounts of money and some of this flowed to the West. It allowed people to buy goods and houses they couldn't afford. And while since the financial crisis we have done more to regulate the financial institutions or allocating the capital flowing into our countries, these excess global balances persist. This remains a global problem and should be addressed with international solutions. And we'll play our full part in helping to attain those answers. Now, I want this commitment to greater international cooperation in matters of trade liberalisation to be matched by greater international cooperation on standards. We cannot outcompete, we, the US, the UK, and our other uh, first world allies, we cannot outcompete emerging economies with cheap labour. There is no future in trying to be cheaper than China or the other emerging economies who have enormous low wage cost uh, advantages. And I'm no fan of excess burdens for business, but we cannot do very much to eradicate this disadvantage with less regulation. So after we leave the European Union, we will not be uh, engaging in a regulatory race to the bottom. That would mean lower global standards for our consumers and poorer prospects for our workers. An independent Britain after Brexit has the opportunity to lead to a race to the top, a race to the top on quality and standards across the globe. Acting as global leader, raising standards across the world, focusing on the high quality, high innovation, high value added sectors where the developed world can compete, where you and we can compete, to the benefit of workers and consumers at home and abroad. Shared standards can lay the foundation for new trade deals. They can build trust between companies in different countries who want to start to trade with each other. They can also help develop better, more efficient products which protect the consumer. Take the automotive industry, just as one example. An industry where the safety of the consumer is paramount. The United Nations Economic Commission for Europe has recently established a new safety standard for all vehicles, electronic stability control. It's now standard for all cars, all new cars being registered in North America, Europe, and in many other countries globally. Standards can help to provide the environment, to, to protect the environment too. The UN International Civil Aviation uh, Organization worked to agreeing measures on aviation's climate impact. In 2016, they agreed a new CO2 standard for new aircraft designed in 2020, setting a new global benchmark for aerospace technology. These standards do more than just protect the environment. They can help drive innovation, promote the uptake of new technology and industry. They can benefit our economy too, by helping companies to export new products and adopt new technology. And they can help spread the new technology which is emerging in this third phase of globalization, such as autonomous vehicles, electric cars, and smart technologies. We're going to have to create a whole new class of standards in the digital data technologies where both our economies dominate. If we're going to prevent some regions using their own standards to create anti-competitive non-tariff barriers, something which is beginning to grow on the data and digital front, uh, people protecting their own economies as they see it by creating their own standards as barriers. The UK has an outstanding record of promoting standards domestically and internationally. I want this to continue after we leave the European Union driving up standards across the globe, helping consumers to benefit from changing technology, helping our workers and companies compete in the new economy, and helping us to build a country ready to compete in the modern world. 
So taken together, this is our vision for Britain after Brexit. A bold vision of international cooperation in which countries like the US and the UK provide global leadership. A Britain committed to striking new free trade agreements across the globe, including with the European Union. A Britain cooperating with our friends and allies to drive up standards around the world. A Britain that helps set the rules of the global system and works to ensure that those rules are honoured. A Britain which is liberal and international, both in temperament and outlook. The Britain that I have long campaigned for. Thank you very much. Now, Todd Myron, I'll take questions, uh, and please don't uh, restrict yourself to just the things I talked about. I know a lot of people want to hear about the details of Brexit as well and negotiations. And as far as I can, you all know that you can't just walk around telling everybody what you're going to do in a negotiation. As far as I can, I'll be as helpful as I can. So let's start over there. Lady in the t table over there. Fran Burwell from the Atlantic Council. Um, two brief questions. I could not agree more. The, with you on the importance of services in the global economy. Have you had any success in convincing some of the top people in this administration who seem focused entirely on trade and goods? Um, and secondly, can you say something, provide a bit of a roadmap for getting to the US-UK free trade agreement? When do you think the um, foundation will have been laid in your relations with the EU so that we can start to think about the timing of serious negotiations on that. All right. On the first uh, issue, I mean, Liam Fox has been working very hard on this and he's absolutely seized of the, of the need to get uh, agreement on services. It should theoretically uh, be uh, easier between us than most others. We, we share a common language, if nothing else. You know. um, but uh, he's been working at it. But it's, it's natural, I'm afraid, in politics for people to focus on the obvious. And you know, it's easy to see lots of cars crossing a border, whatever. It's harder to see the effect of, uh, uh, of, as it were, the virtual world of services. But we are working on that. You may be sure that's, that's on our priorities. On the US-UK, free trade agreement, the, I suspect at the end of the day the limiting factor in time terms will be when we conclude uh, the European Union agreement. Just so that people understand, we are bound by a, a, a piece of European law called a duty of sincere cooperation. Forgive me, I'm going to dive into a little bit of legal technology for a second. A duty of sincere cooperation, which means that what we do cannot undermine anything the European Union is doing let's say, in setting up its own trade arrangements and so on. So we can't sort of act in, in parallel to that. So technically, we are restricted in the extent to which we can negotiate, but that reduction, that, that, that restriction reduces as we get closer to the, the end. One aspect here, of course, is what happens if we end up with what I call an implementation period, other people call transition phases and so on. What I would say to you is my expectation is that we would not have an impl implementation in force during a transition period or during an, uh, an implementation period uh, because that would be building a big loophole in the Europe's common external tariff barrier. But we could certainly conclude the negotiation and we could certainly be ready to go on day one once it's over. So in timetable terms, that's how it goes. Now, that's not... Uh, uh, very much out of line with what would naturally be the timetable anyway. We're, between us, we're big, complex economies with huge volumes of existing trade, but even bigger volumes of potential trade. So you must expect the deal we do to be quite complex and quite extensive. So it, I don't think, uh, although that's a technical limit on it, I don't think it'll actually prove to be a real limit. Um, over there, sir. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, and uh, thanks for your great presentation today. Two questions related to current European politics. You serve in a government that was narrowly re-elected and at different times it was felt would not be able to form a new government. How long will the current government remain and are you absolutely certain um, that Prime Minister May will be able to write the final chapter in Brexit. My second question is, another great lady of Europe will be in the news very soon. Chancellor Merkel is headed toward a big re-election in Germany for her fourth mandate. 
uh, how will her reelection and presumably enhanced hand affect the Brexit negotiations? Okay. Two very good uh, questions. And I'm told to say my name, John Gizzi, Chief Political Correspondent with Newsmax. Right, okay. That's, uh, um, John, the, my expectation is the, the government will last the five years. I mean, the, we have changed our structure recently. Uh, it used to be that prime ministers would call the elections whenever they liked. Uh, and now we have a five year, which makes it actually quite difficult to, uh, to, to call it early. Uh, and the, uh, in terms of the Brexit negotiation, there's, uh, your profession has great fun with us sometimes uh, on the politics of Brexit. The real issue on Brexit is mostly, is mostly practical. It's, you know, what sort of deal do we need? Uh, what can we sell to the other European countries? What is in the mutual best interests of all of us? Uh, and that's, that's the driver. And it's the same driver within the parliamentary arithmetic. Um, there is a majority to carry through Brexit in, uh, in the uh, UK Parliament, uh, and it will get done. It will get done in time. Um, for Mrs Merkel, we're very, care we're very careful, government ministers, about commenting other on other countries' politics when we're abroad. It gets us into unending trouble if we break the rules, so I've got to be a bit careful how I respond. But <clears throat> the primary effect <clears throat> of the European, oh, sorry, of the German election on the Brexit process is a timing one. Uh, it's going to happen in September, September 26th, I think, from memory. And uh, it's, uh, but the normally after a German election, because of their system, it takes one to three months to form a new coalition, sometimes even longer if it's, if it's, a, if it's an issue. And it's the new government which will be very important. And of course, within the politics of Europe, uh, Germany is enormously important. It's, uh, it's the biggest country in economic terms, biggest country in population terms. It's, uh, it's a paymaster in many ways. Um, it has a lot of influence. Of course, it's a founder member. Uh, uh, so it, it, it's hard to overestimate the influence of it. So the outcome of the German election, I'm not going to guess what it's going to be. Um, I have my views and I'm quite optimistic about it, but uh, uh, I'm not going to guess publicly what it's going to be. Uh, but the outcome of the German election will, I think, be to accelerate the process once it's happened. Next question. Over here, sir. Hi, Mike Mullen with Brambles. Thank you so much for being here and for your uh, noteworthy remarks on trade. And thank you to Myron Brilliant and Marjorie Chorlins for your leadership on this issue for American business. Uh, we agree that trade equals better lives for all people. The mechanics of trade, though, are something that we know that you're focusing on, and we'd like to just highlight an issue for you. Um, about 50 million pallets and other containers hundreds of other millions of containers go between the channel, uh, between both sides, carrying goods, fresh fruit, uh, produce, uh, fast-moving consumer goods. The um, phytosanitary standards, if the status quo is changed, would have to be changed as well, which would require heat treatment and certification of those pallets as they move across borders, creating additional costs, not, for, not just for the companies in this room and the companies in the UK and the EU, but for mom and dad in, in Main Street and in Weybridge or other communities. Um, I wonder if, you, I know that you have not had the pleasure to get into the weeds that deep, but we hope that your team will and would welcome any thoughts you have on the mechanics and how we can improve it. Well, funnily enough, after, thank you for the question. I mean, j just to say to people generally, that those who are not familiar with the uh, uh, arcane area of phytosanitary standards, um, uh, it, it is one of the major issues in the uh, cross-border uh, trade post-departure. Uh, um, just to put it in context, not looking at trade with um, European Union countries, but you're looking at trade into Britain from outside the common external tariff barrier. 90% uh, of containers are cleared in five seconds coming in. Uh, using electronic pre-notification mechanisms uh, and so on. After this meeting, and I've got one other meeting in Washington, I'm going to the, the Canadian border to, to look there. I used to sell uh, high fructose syrup across the border to uh, big breweries in Detroit and the like. Uh, so I was very conscious of my syrup going off if the customs people kept them for too long. Uh, so with, this is an area where we're going to have to do a great deal of work in terms of ensuring that we have a parallel, if not identical, standard uh, afterwards. One of the things that people forget, however, in this is 
the way we're approaching this negotiation in parliamentary terms is we are ensuring that unless we deliberately choose not to, unless we deliberately choose not to, every standard that currently exists and we've been put uh, those now and those that we put in place in the next two years will be standards that apply to British products the day after we leave. I, when I return to, uh, to Britain uh, over the weekend, the first thing I do when I get back to Parliament pretty much, we're taking through a thing we used to call the Great Repeal Bill, which actually is the Great Continuity Bill. It keeps in our law all of the standards that ex uh, exist there now. So we have this spectacular, unique aspect of this trade deal with the European Union, which is that unlike every other trade deal in the world, we start with our standards in exactly the same place as everybody else. There is no need to spend several years getting the standards aligned. We know exactly where we are and we know them well. So that's, that's the strategy. That's the strategy. You're right. There's a lot of weeds to get into in it, um, but we're acutely conscious of it. Uh, uh, and, and, the, and in particular, the, the agribusiness area is going to be one of the most complex, not just in terms of that, but in terms of subsidy paralleling and all the rest of it. So a complex issue, which once we start down it, uh, will be uh, eminently manageable, but because we start from a good place. Uh, I'd probably take two more from the room, and I'm, I'm, I'm required, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, to take them from the, from the press as well. Um, let me see, sir. sir. Uh, hi, Ralph Carter with, uh, with FedEx. Uh, I also appreciate your strong pro-trade message. It's very helpful. Uh, following a, with a question on customs, uh, I read <clears throat> one of the latest papers that you mentioned uh, that the UK put out yeah. with this vision for the longer-term customs relations. Uh, I think you made two proposals. One would establish a customs regime, controls between the UK and the EU, uh, as you say, seamless and frictionless. The second proposal seemed to propose uh, ha not having a customs regime, but trying to track and trace goods that came into the UK from other countries under other customs regimes. Could you talk about this second proposal and how that would work and the yeah. tracking that, that is envisioned in that? This is, you, you just asked me a question which is a subject for a whole new speech, so I'm going to try and avoid that. Um, what uh, what, what uh, uh, the gentleman uh, has asked is, is that the, we published a paper about the possible customs regimes. We, we put up uh, one uh, proposal which is a very practical proposal, right? Uh, it's all about facilitating, it's about using automatic number plate recognition on vehicles crossing the border, it's about pre-notification, it's about using um, authorised economic op operators or trusted traders, do you use the same phrase here? Um, uh, the, those sorts of things to, to practically make the burden of crossing the border between the UK and the EU as low as it possibly can be, indeed in Northern Ireland, invisible, right? Um, and that will be doable if we have struck a free trade agreement, which is essentially non-tariff. Non because then the only reason you really have to stop at the borders uh, are regulatory inspections, phytosanitary ones, uh, and rules of origin inspections. So that's the, that's the conventional approach. Now the other one is a sort of blue sky approach in, in a sense, is saying, okay, let's just take a completely imaginative approach and say we just stay inside, look like we stay inside the customs union, but uh, we virtually control everything coming in. So if you're selling into Britain, you get your tariff zeroed or you get it given back to you or whatever. Um, but if you are going to uh, uh, export into Britain to, for onward sale into the European Union, you pay your common external tariff when you come into Britain and then move onwards. The advantage of that is it requires uh, no great transformation of customs in France and Holland and Belgium and Denmark, which we don't control. It means all of the problems are for us to deal with, but it does have an administrative burden. If you are a, if you are a, a company bringing product in, you have to track the product and know where it's going. Uh, so that's how it works. That's the, that's the concept. It was a blue sky idea. I think the most likely is the first one, not the second. 
uh, in other words, a practical one, uh, and vast amounts of work are going into that. I spend, well, one of my ministers spends his time um, tearing his hair out, following the critical path of, of all the various uh, practical changes. But that's how, it, that's, the, that's how it works. So that's how wide we are going in terms of imaginative options. And it's not just true for customs, it's true for a whole series of other areas. So that's what that is. Let me take one last one from the room before we go to the media. Uh, sir, there. Thank you, Secretary Davis. My name is Geir Harte. I'm the ambassador of Iceland here in DC. I'm wondering how seriously you have thought about using the European Free Trade Association and the European Economic Area Agreement between EFTA and the EU as a transitory mechanism. In other words, for the period where you have to work out all the details for your completely leaving the, free, the, the, the internal market. Yeah. Well, we obviously thought about it. Um, the, one of the great arguments for, for, the, for the, you know, none of you would have followed it in the detail that I have to, but one of the great arguments that take place in the United Kingdom is how much transition will we have? How will we avoid a, a, a cliff edge, is the uh, term of art, a sudden change? And this, is, this transition period, people think, tend to think of it as a single thing. Actually, it's not. It's a different thing if you're a bank or you're in financial services than if you are uh, producing agri-products uh, agri uh, or if you are uh, working in a, a regime which is um, uh, heavily regulated, maybe cars or whatever, or indeed whether you've got um, uh, cross-border traffic going backwards and forwards. You perhaps got a just-in-time manufacturing operation, which is suppliers uh, in many countries and and and, uh, uh, and customers in many countries. Um, and so the first thing to say is that the nature of the implementation period or the transition period, um, uh, if we agree such a thing, uh, is is not as clear-cut as people say uh, or people think at the beginning. Um, in terms of the uh, idea of using EFTA and EEA, again, for those of you who are not familiar with it, the uh, uh, countries like Norway and Switzerland uh, have different relationships uh, through, the, through uh, 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 an EEA uh, um, arrangement. Um, the, it has its own burdens. It has its own negotiating uh, issue to uh, get over. So it doesn't necessarily save us very much time. Uh, and, the, and the issue in this thing, as you can probably imagine, this is probably the most complicated negotiation in history, actually. Uh, and our enemy, in a way, is time. We've got two years. We've got to conclude it in two years. We've got to conclude the negotiation in two years. And the reason of transition is to give us a bit more time for the practicalities, to allow other countries to put new customs arrangements in, to allow us to build a regulatory regime, to allow businesses to change their way of doing business, to cope with the outcome and so on. So, uh, so those, uh, those are the sorts of reasons. And it's not, at this stage, clear enough to, uh, to, uh, to know how, what the transition will look like. But uh, adding another phase of negotiation wouldn't necessarily help that. So it's not, it's not at the top of our list. We've thought about it, but it's not, it's not at the top of the list. Now, I've promised to take some questions from uh, journalists. Uh, I'm trying to see which table they're on somewhere. Where are you? Here. Oh, yeah, got you. Yeah, so if I, Gary, I can see you. There we are. Now, let's start with, start with Gary from the BBC. Gary Donoghue, BBC News. Uh, Secretary of State, I wonder if you could uh, address the issue of the, the impasse, the current impasse on the divorce settlement and the level of it. What's the government's view of perhaps continuing to pay some money uh, into the EU in the transition period, reducing the sort of block payment you have to pay before that in order to unblock the talks in, in October and to get onto a, a trade deal? Is that something you'd consider? And secondly, can I ask uh, on a personal level, do you feel a lot more welcome in this town than you ever do in Brussels? <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, I'll, I'll answer the second one first. It's more fun. That's, uh, um, is, this isn't the first time um, uh, that, I've, that I've negotiated in Brussels. I mean, you would have no reason to know, but basically, uh, in British... Uh, in British political terms, my second name is Lazarus, right? I've come back from the dead. Right? Uh, I, was out, I, I, I left government pretty much on my own behest uh, to go and fight on civil justice matters uh, sometime. But, but before then, I was uh, Europe minister. And um, 
when uh, at the end of a long negotiation for the Amsterdam Treaty, uh, the British press, probably Gary amongst them, tried to get tried to get all the other players in the in the negotiation to say something disobliging about me. Uh, they found they couldn't get it because actually uh, I take the view that there's you know you may argue, but there's no reason not to be friends. Um, and eventually, however, they did get one of my uh, fellow uh, negotiators to uh, comment on me to give a comment on me. The Financial Times got him to, to say something. He said, well, he said, David is a master of constructive obstruction. He is a charming bastard. <laughs> so the headline on the front page of the Financial Times was charming bastard, you know. But actually, I was rather proud of it. <laughs> because, of course, I had to be both charming, but sometimes difficult. And, uh, and that's the nature of what you're seeing now, Gary. That, you know, there are going to be tough times in this. Indeed, Michel Barnier, who I deal with, was actually on that team at the time. Um, so there will, be, there will be tough times. But the trick in this is to remember the end of it. One, we want an outcome which is in everybody's interest. This is not a zero-sum game. And you know, we all know, all of you know, uh, those of you who negotiate, as most of you will. You know, the, the world outside thinks negotiation is all about machismo. More it's about finding solutions in everybody's interest. And that's the first thing to remember. Secondly, when we, when we leave, we want to continue to be allies. You know, we're the biggest military power in Europe. We're the biggest in terms of spending. We're the biggest uh, uh, in terms of spending on uh, international development. We are a huge influence. We are very important in counterterrorism. We're the biggest... Um, we're the biggest intelligence power in, in Europe. We're the biggest, we're a science superpower like you. So, you know, so there are lots and lots of things we want to stay friends on. So that's the, that's the, that, that's the first thing, Gary, to, to, your, to your second question. And I'm, look, I'm not going to do the negotiation from the, uh, from the lectern, and you are far too smart to expect me to do so. But uh, what's been going on, again, for the, for, the, for the audience, what's been going on is we, we got to the point today where there's been some pressure in the last couple of days, a pressure over the question of whether we pay a divorce bill, a separation bill, and if so, what it is. And there have been stories flying around, some of them emanating from Paris, that maybe one way of doing this is to pay for the transition period and so on. Well, I can't comment because we haven't started that negotiation. Um, but let me say this, that you know, we have... Uh, uh, as I've just explained, a very complex negotiation to do on transition alone. Uh, and when we come to that, we will, uh, we will have uh, 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 questions to deal with in financial terms, I'm sure, as well. Sorry? I'm not ruling anything or out. I mean, I never do, as you well know. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, but, uh, so, but, you know, the, it's, it's an idea that's been floated around. Um, the, the, the contention that's been happening, again, for the American uh, audience, the, the contention that's been... Um, uh, going on the last few days is that the European negotiators are trying to say, well, we should settle the financial thing first and then trade and other things later. Um, and then we should do that because there's a legal requirement on you. Well, what we've been doing is, as uh, you do if somebody provides you with a good bill, uh, a, a large bill, is go through it line by line. Uh, and we've got very good lawyers. Um, so it gets a bit, it's getting a bit tense, but you know, it's only, it's only, it's just only early stages in this, so, so, so I rule nothing in, nothing out. Um, um, Siobhan, Sky. Hello. There you are, right. Siobhan Robin, <laughs> Sky News. Um, in the interest of being friends, which you just um, highlighted there, do you think blackmail is an appropriate word to describe the EU's approach to the Brexit <laughs> bill negotiations. I never comment, I know what you're doing, I never comment on, uh, on, on, on other ministers' views on these things. Look, we are in a, uh, a difficult and tough, complicated negotiation. I have said from the beginning, it will be turbulent. What we're having at the moment is the first ripple, um, and there'll be many more ripples along the way. Um, and I'm going to own at least the first half of my Financial Times description, the charming bit, uh, at great length. Um, uh, who have we got from Politico? Sorry, I don't, I don't know the Politico person. Ha. Hi, uh, Katie O'Donnell with Politico. Yeah. Um, two questions. Uh, Michel Barnier has made it pretty clear that the UK won't be able to kind of cherry pick advantages of being in the EU uh, without being a member. So how are you going to sell that to UK voters that they're going to have to lose some benefits? And then also, in terms of the special relationship, you talked about how the US and the UK will kind of team up to lead the world in standards. But isn't the UK kind of 
less useful to the U.S. now that it doesn't have a seat at the table in Brussels? All right. Um, the, the first thing, I mean, cherry pick. Look, cherry pick is, in, in negotiations, you have pejorative terms thrown about. I could, I could give you a list of things the European Union is doing, saying that's cherry picking on something or other, if, if I wanted to. But that's, I've, I've sort of told the, the British Parliament they are going to be astonished by my politeness in the next two years because there's no point in getting into a tit-for-tat exchange of, well, you said this, so I'm going to be rude to you back. It's ridiculous. It's not the way to do it. Um, the issue in terms of the outcome at the end is that what we want to see is a free trade agreement. Now, people say, well, how can you do that in two years? Well, I go back to the point I made to some gentlemen over here, that we are already in a position where our standards are identical, identical. To, uh, uh, to the ones in the European Union. Indeed, we helped set some of them. So that's straightforward in terms of free trade agreement. And bear in mind the other way around. The other way around, not just about the British, uh, the British uh, population. We sell, uh, the last numbers we have, it's actually bigger now, the last uh, audited numbers for trade with the European Union, we sell 230 billion euros, think dollars, uh, basically 230 billion dollars thereabouts uh, to them they sell 290 billion to us. Now, both those numbers have gone up. So who's got the interest in a free trade agreement in this? Hmm? You know, uh, us uh, or, or them? The answer is, of course, both. And there are parts of Europe which are very, very concerned about, containing, uh, about getting a free trade agreement. You know, it's going to have big impact on, on all of the so-called, what we think of as the literal states, all of the people on the North Sea, France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark. They've all got very, very serious trade arrangements. Rotterdam, one of the biggest uh, container ports in the world, you know, is going to be very concerned that we have a decent free trade agreement. So, so that's the first thing. It's not about cherry picking. It's about doing what's best for both of us. U.S. special relationship. Yeah. People talk it up and talk it down over the years. Look, first thing we start with, as I said when I started, started this, the, the speech, you know, I, I am proud to be here because you are a country, this country is a country based on a fabulous idea. You know, your, your founding fathers were an incredibly judicious group of geniuses. Uh, in designing a constitution for a country. Uh, and uh, the, why, they, their job was made slightly easier by the fact they picked off bits of our constitution to do it. We have similar, similar uh, judicial arrangements. We have similar democratic arrangements. They're not the same, but they're similar enough. We have a common way of looking at things. We have spectacular cooperation on military matters, on intelligence matters, and of course we are huge trading partners to each other, and we are the two biggest powers in, in global financial services together. I mean, the, uh, the, if the French ambassador is in the room, I apologise, but you know, financial services internationally is essentially an English-speaking trade. You know, why? because of New York and London, and of course Hong Kong and Singapore as well. But, you know, so, so we have fantastic uh, things that hold us together, that draw us together, and continue to draw us together. You know, and, and 20 years ago you might have been thinking, um, at the end of the Soviet era, well the reasons holding this all together have gone away. Well what have we found in the last 20 odd years? That's not true anymore. You know, we know the threats are still there. We know the concerns are still there. We know the worries are still there. We know that we still have uh, natural uh, disasters. I'm being waved at by my, uh, my minder over there. <laughs> um, um, and we know these things are all massively important and we are good at dealing, we are better at dealing with them together than we are separately. So, you know, it doesn't matter uh, what people say, oh, it's up and down. We have got the best bond between two, two countries that any uh, two countries in the modern world have got and indeed have got in my memory. We are allies, we are friends, we are people with a common value system, we are the joint, not just, not the only ones, but we are two major upholders of our view of how a civilized country should operate. And you know, for that reason alone, I'm very proud to be here today. Thank you very much. So David Davis there, talking to the American Chambers and, uh, of Commerce. It made America realize that Britain was her real and true friend uh, when they were hard up against it and wanted something, and that no one else in Europe was. There are weak lots, some of them in Europe, you know. Weak, feeble.